All right. Good to see everybody. Let's get started. Great to be with you. Looks like a few more people just entered the session, so good time to get started. You should be able to see the screen okay. We are uh, looking at the S&P at the moment. Great. So, um, first of all, is there anyone in our group today that is new to uh, listening to me or the supply and demand strategy that we use here uh, during our sessions? Anyone brand new to that? Right. I don't see any. I don't see any yeses. So, and okay, a few. All right. And the reason why I ask is because uh, I'll know how you know how you know the more I I understand how how what well, you understand uh, that that helps me understand how to you know how deep to go and uh, or how to just kind of maybe just run through the markets and all that. So lots to do here. Markets are moving, and um, we'll talk through we'll talk through all of it. So as you know, for those of you that've been with us for a while, and for those that are or f and for those that are new, we use one strategy here. And just give me about thirty seconds, and I'll explain uh, the logic behind it. Now, you know all all I've ever um, really focused on and, and talked about is the simple principles of how the markets work, meaning two things, how and why prices move in markets and how and why money is made and lost in markets. My experience comes from the trading floor of the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, where I uh, spent time in the early days facilitating institutional order flow. And very quickly it became clear to me that um, it's all about supply and demand. At every price point, you have a certain amount of supply, a certain amount of demand. Whatever that equation is, is going to determine where price is going to go from there. Does everybody understand that? Another way to say that is the movement of price in any and all markets is simply a function of an ongoing supply and demand equation or relationship. When that simple and straightforward equation is out of balance, price moves. What I also realized was the deeper you kind of, it's funny you use the word deeper, the, the, the kind of the deeper you get into that principle or concept, uh, because it's not deep at all, it's really quite simple, because you realize that how money is made and lost in any other part of life or any other, anything else we buy and sell is exactly how money is made and lost uh, in the markets, right? It's all about buying low, sell high, specifically buy at wholesale prices or demand, sell at retail prices or supply. Does everybody understand that? Any, um, and, and you know, I know, especially in these FXG street sessions, you've got, you know, a lot of people are exploring all kinds of different strategies and, and there's tons out there, lots of technical analysis stuff and fundamental analysis stuff and all that. But at the end of the day, it's how much demand and how much supply is at the price points. That's what matters. So what I did by, uh, because I was, you know, dealing in institutional order flow, um, you know, you see that if you have a price point where you have, where demand greatly exceeds supply, and, and you look around the trading floor and the rest of the market has a lot of demand there, well, when prices gets to that level, it's gonna, going to go higher, right, usually. I mean, it, it is, unless you get there and supply exceeds demand, but that was, that rarely happened. Um, and, uh, and then where's it going to move to? It's going to move to typically to where supply is. So seeing this, you know, every day, every week, every month, I just started to bring price charts over to the trade desk and say, okay, at all these turning points, what does that look like on the price chart? Right? Because I wanted to learn charts because I wanted a, I wanted a, a life outside of the, uh, trading floor. I wanted a, a new trading career outside of the trading floor. Want to do this from home? This is the late '90s, where you could start to look at charts at home. So when I start to put this, uh, put these pictures on the chart where price was turning and, and why and all that, um, that's these supply and demand zones. That's where they come from. Does everybody understand that? Everybody pretty clear on that? All right. I want to make sure you understand the logic. So it's not that you know when you come to these sessions, it's not like, um, it's not like anyone owns supply and demand or or you know I. 
figured out the secrets of the markets. This is not any secret at all, right? I'm just the messenger. This is how the markets really work. And, um, and here's what that looks like on a price chart. Easier said than done, of course, because there's, especially like today, so much fundamental information that, that drives people's emotions and all that. Um, right, current times with this coronavirus scare, you've got a lot of people taking positions in the market or, or getting in or out of positions based on emoji, emotion, not, not logic and intellect. So be very careful. One of the themes I like to mention quite a bit, and it's very appropriate today, is in my opinion, it's always a good idea to focus on what's real, not what you feel. If you're selling today out of fear, like a lot of people are, right? Prices have been going down a little bit today in the equity index markets anyway. That's because supply exceeds demand. So that just means there's a lot of supply coming into the market. Well, if you're focused on what you feel, you're probably selling because you're scared. If you focus on what's real, now's probably not a great time to sell because price has fallen so much and it's nearing some larger time frame demand. Okay. Uh, so let's see what all this looks like on a price chart and move forward. I can look at any charts uh, you want to. I have a whole list of them here that we can go through. But remember, when we talk about the strategy and the strategy rules, we apply them equally to any and all markets, stocks, futures, forex, options, bonds, crypto, you name it. And, um, and whatever you're trying to accomplish, whether it's uh, short-term you know, trading goals, longer-term trading goals, something in the middle, and we apply the rules uh, pretty much equally. And of course, with everything you do, make sure you, if you're going to take any action, make sure you fully understand the risk. Um, I assume you're okay with the reward, but make sure you fully understand the risk. And, and that's really the key to taking action. If you're wanting to get into positions, but you, it's just you've got this fear, one of the things that it might be a good idea is focus on the worst case scenario. In other words, you've got this position you want to get into. You, you've figured out your position size and what you want to do. And, uh, but there's still a little fear getting in the market. Think of your worst case scenario. If this doesn't work and you, and you lose money, but you follow your plan, what's going to happen? Are you going to lose $30, $300? $3,000, you know, whatever the number is, are you okay with that? And if you're not okay with that, probably not a good idea to take that trade, right? That's really, that's one of the ways to get over fear. All right, so if anybody um, has any markets they want me to look at, just type them in the chat and I can take a look at them and we'll, we'll, we'll apply our supply demand uh, logic and rules to uh, all these markets. And again, we can look at Futures, Forex, stocks, bonds, doesn't matter. All right, Euro and Russell. And we'll certainly look at the dollar in, in just a few minutes. Since we're looking at the equity index group, though, why don't we go to the Russell? Russell's an interesting one to look at at the moment because it just came down to some larger time frame demand. Let me just take a look at uh, what that looks like on this time frame. Yeah, so this is the general area that we're looking at here. Um, let me get that for you here. So here it is. Okay. So we see current price right here. We're getting a little bit of a little bounce. So we came down to um, we had this area. Uh, I do a. You know. So this is a level uh, that we've been looking at for a while. This is the fifteen twelve down to fifteen hundred uh, even in the Russell. And uh, this is the futures. So we just came down to this area now. Um, you can see I didn't, you know, I've had this level on the chart for a while. And that's after falling from our supply zone up here around 1,700. And I think we went over this level either last session or the time before that. Anybody, anybody take that position? Anybody able to get in that and hold it down all the way down to demand? And if not, it's okay. And by the way, again, I just want to remind you, we're looking at the Russell now. You know, someone asked and... Um, before you, if you look at any of these markets that you don't know, before you get excited about jumping into them, make sure you understand the price points and risk and all that before you jump into that. So we're down into uh, a little bit of demand here. If you wanted to refine that and go down uh, a time frame or two and take a look, here's a big picture look at that demand zone. Uh, but we also have this sitting just below. So uh, let me get that in here for you. 
That's this area right there. And I made it a little bit wider than it actually is. Uh, but there it is. Okay. So we got kind of two areas on top of each other in the Russell here. Uh, even if it, the market makes a new low over the next few minutes or so, there's a good chance that you'll see a nice, uh, nice little bounce out of this area. Now, before we would just jump in and maybe take a position in this market, there's other things we can do, right? We want to be able to really understand the probability of price turning. So what else could we do? What else could we look at to uh, get some of that information? Well, we can go to the bond market, right? Maybe the bonds are into supply. Okay. Let's, uh, let's take a look. Uh, let's see, Ed, I'll read back in the chat. Yeah, so I, I think you're talking about demand here, at least those, those uh, Russell levels, unless you're just talking in general, but a two-bar supply zone. So, yeah, I, I assume you mean like two candles or two bars next to each other. You know, that's typically okay, but when you see one or two candles or bars on the chart and you, and you think that's a zone, for me, it's always a better idea to go down a time frame and look inside that area. If we start taking one or two candles or bars as zones, then everything becomes a zone. So I would always suggest going down a time frame and making sure that that's still a, you know, a decent area. And look, if it's around, if you have the, the proper picture of a quality supplier demand zone, if it's around uh, a pivot high or pivot low, that's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. That just tells you uh, prices are likely way out on the supply demand curve, right? We'd have to look at some real examples, but hopefully that makes sense. So we've got the, we're looking at the 30 year, and I want to go right to the weekly chart here because what you'll see is you're getting pretty close to this larger time frame supply zone in the 30 year bond. Up here, we would uh, expect price to turn lower um, for a bit. Well, though we do have some demand a little bit down here, but still, that's a big move. So if and when the 30-year gets close to or reaches this level, we'd be looking for uh, possible demand zones in the equity index markets. Now, you see the distance of the bonds to the supply zone here? I want to take you to the S&P for a minute. Let's go to the daily chart. And I want to show you, um, look what's sitting just below. All right? We have a two demand zones that are sitting on top of each other. See that? They're fresh zones, meaning they have not had any pullbacks yet. When you look at any of these levels above, right, like that zone or that area, they're, they're nice areas, but they're not fresh. This one had a pullback. That one had a pullback. Okay? So they're not fresh. Like we said last session, we've we got, you know, the equity index market's got really far away from demand, um, suggesting it's not going to take much to bring prices back in, you know, back in. That's how supplier demand works, right? So bonds potentially nearing supply, S&P potentially nearing this demand, that's where you could see a, a, a pretty significant turn. Does that make sense? And, um, okay. All right, why don't we go over to, I see uh, some people want to look at the euro. So let's take a look at the euro. And uh, let me see here. Okay, let's look at both the, uh, let me start with the euro futures, and then we can probably just take a look at the spots. It's going to be the same thing. But... Um, uh, let's see here. Actually, we, let's just go to this spot. I think more people here choose, you look at the spot, right? So, okay. So let's get some levels in here. And let's look at the dollar. I'm sorry. Let's look at the dollar. Oh, the dollar is nearing some demand. I know that because uh, just looking at it. But let's go to the dollar. So you see how, I, I don't know if you're looking at my symbol list here, but see how I have the dollar index and then below that the dollar futures? Be careful because when you look at both of these, the, uh, yeah, Frank, we, uh, we'll, go, we'll go to the spot. When you look at the dollar futures and dollar index, often those levels are not in the same area. So 
make sure you're aware of that. In other words, if you're just looking at that dollar index and you're thinking, oh, there's a great level, but you want to take the trade in the, in the futures, make sure you look at the futures chart too because uh, often, I would, I would actually say most of the time, those levels are not exactly in the, in the same area. So you're going to want to watch that. When, do, when, does that, when is price going to get to that, level, that same level you're looking at in the dollar futures? Um, when do they line up? When don't they? And so on. All right, so going to the dollar. Um, actually, let me just take you to a different workspace right here real quick. So there's that S&P. Let me go over to the dollar only because I know I have the level on the chart right here. Sorry for bouncing around like this. Okay, so we look at the four-hour chart. You see how price in the dollar here is coming down to this. There it is. That should be nice and big for you. So if we're, if we're going to look at the euro and try to find a potential turning point in the euro, not a bad idea to look at the dollar first uh, or, or, or second, but just make sure we look at it. We have what looks to be a nice demand zone sitting down around 98.20. That goes all the way down to 98 even. And then below that, 97.90 down to 97.70. All right. So having said that, let's go back over here. So then we see that we've got some demand below on the dollar. Let's go to the euro. Let's go back to the euro and find uh, that equivalent supply zone above. Okay. So really, here's where they start up here. Let me see if we can get something. Uh, yeah, let's see. Yeah, so we're really looking at uh, this level up here. Put that in. Here it is, this one. So, there, you know, we do have rules around putting your levels in and lines in and all that. And then we do have another level sitting just above it. Again, it looks like, it looks like a, a quality level. Okay, does that make sense? So now when you're looking at this, also think of that dollar demand below. Um, I'd, you know, I'd want to be watching both of those charts to make sure that we've got those levels right when, especially, you know, when the dollar, if and when the dollar hits that demand zone, is the euro also in a zone? It probably will be. Does everybody see this level just below? Anyone thinking, well, why not take that one? That's the problem here. Why not take that one? If you are thinking that, uh, good, good question there, EP. I'll explain that. So you see how in this one we have a wick to the upside? And that's in a supply zone, right? So, again, let's think of the sip. <laughs> Sorry about that. Sneeze. Um, so think of the logic behind, thank you, think of the logic behind the uh, the big, the wick to the upside here, and then you have the wick to the downside here. What does the wick to the upside mean? Well, if we're thinking that there's a lot of supply in here, in other words, that supply greatly exceeds demand at this price point, if that's what we're thinking in this area, how is it possible that price was able to trade up to here before moving lower? Does everybody understand that? Again, if right if 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 price was up here that means the significant supply is likely above that right if there was so much supply in this base well price wouldn't go up from that base it wouldn't be able to it'd be physically impossible you'd have too much supply so a wick or or price action to the upside in a supply zone is no good just like a wick or price action to the downside in a demand zone is no good so now let's look at this wick up here that you're asking about. There is a big wick to the downside, but it's in the supply zone. And it's in the beginning of the supply zone, right? Okay, what we don't want to see is a wick to the upside anywhere in this base. Because what that would tell us is there's probably not a lot of supply in the base. Yeah, just keep it really simple and always think the logic through on just the basics of supply and demand. And, you know, what that objective information is telling you. Okay, so I think we're good on the euro. Looked at the dollar. 
And, and notice too, kind of the theme, right? When we looked at the, the Russell or an equity index group, we also looked at the bonds. When we looked at the euro, we also looked at the dollar. Right? What do we try? What are we attempting to do with that? We're, we're attempting to see are the odds stacked in our favor with our trading idea or not? And both sides of that information are equally important, right? I'd love to see something that says, hey, the trading idea I'm thinking of, wow, looking at these correlated markets, the odds are stacked in uh, my favor that this is going to turn and work. But I'd also like to know equally that, ooh, based on these correlations, that might not be such a great idea. Okay. Uh, let's go to the pound. Let me go to the futures real quick just to see. Uh, usually my futures charts are a little more updated than the spot. Okay, yeah, we're coming off our four-hour supply, daily demand. All right, let's go back to the spot market. Okay, so looking here, um, we go to, yeah, the, the, the pound really is, after hitting our supply zone, it really isn't doing a whole lot. Uh, hang on a second. Let me go back to the futures to see where that demand was. Yeah, that, I mean, in this daily level, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go with that again. I mean, you know, the challenge with doing anything in, in the pound is when you look at the past month, we've just been in this ugly range, right, from the demand side up to, you know, the supply side here, right? So we really need to get out of this range to you know, find uh, any quality. What we can do is look inside this rally on a smaller time frame and see if anything's there that we'd be interested in. Right now we're looking at a daily chart. so. Let's start by going down to here. There's that, there's this area here. So again, we, we don't want to get interested in any of this stuff. Okay, the presence of all this trading activity up here suggests filled orders or a lack of supply and demand. So when we look below all that, we start, to, you know, we really want to, when I said, let's look at that rally, we really want to look at this area here. So, you know, this is probably nothing. Uh, but here we have a little bit of demand, right? Very little trading, strong rally away from the level. The level is fresh. Now when we look to the left of the level, was there supply in this area prior to the level being developed? That's important information for us because it helps us identify supplier demand levels where there's a big imbalance. Very key information. Okay, so... Let's get this in here. So I'm going to take the lowest price in the base and all the way up to the origin of the rally. Okay. All right, so we have a ways to go to get there. But again, it's the pound. When, when, when you're looking at any market that is trading at the same price point that it's been trading at for multiple days, you know, you're, not, you're, you're probably not going to want to jump in the market that day or, or right there. I mean, prices need to get away from that middle and out to price levels where you'll find the big supply demand imbalances. All right, so that's the euro on the um, supply side and demand side. Does anybody have any other markets they want to look at? Again, I can continue to go through my list or uh, if you have a market, I'm happy to take a look at it and uh, apply our, you know, all right. Okay, there we go. I see someone, yeah, we'll look at gold. Um, yeah, Mohit, I, I see what you're saying about the, uh, the head and shoulders and the one hour chart, right? So I think you're talking about this right here. Uh, this stuff. 
Yeah, so let's talk. And does anybody else have a favorite um, chart pattern from technical analysis? Anybody else have a, a favorite chart pattern they care to share? What's another kind of favorite you look at or care to share or any of that stuff? Any others? Huh. All right, Frank. Frank knows where I'm going with this conversation. Um, okay. So let me just, um, the W pattern. Okay. All right. So you might be thinking, you know, when I wanted to leave the trading floor and start trading from home, why didn't I just get involved in technical analysis? Rectangles, I see that in the chat. Why didn't I just go get a technical analysis book and, you know, that talks about head and shoulder patterns and just go find all the head and shoulder patterns or the Ws or, or any of that stuff? Why didn't I do that? Well, I learned about that stuff a little bit later, but as soon as I, here's the thing, a lot of light bulb moments went off for me early on. One of the biggest ones was when I first got exposed to this conventional technical analysis, which is still what most people kind of use and look at, right? When I first got exposed to that, um, it didn't make any sense to me. The reason why it didn't make any sense to me is because I had already been kind of trained and brainwashed with this whole supply and demand concept. And and not because anybody told me to, because I just observed. I mean, that's how prices move in any market, right? But I saw, for example, let's look at this one real quick, and then we'll move on. But when I started to see this, all this technical analysis stuff, I guess here's the head and shoulders pattern you're talking about, right? So when you start to see this stuff, you're like, okay. Um, and just tell me if I do this right. Is this where... Is, is, is that the head and shoulders pattern or, or is or, or that? Is that? That's probably it, right? Is that what you do? Is that the rule in all the trading books? Like, I think that's called the neckline, right? Is that how it's done? Right, so there's your shoulder, your head, your other shoulder over here. So what are you supposed to do right here? And I'll read back in the chat in a minute, but what are you supposed to do right here? What's the rule? Once you see this pattern, you then put this line in, and what are you supposed to do right here? What's the action you take? Right? Yeah, you're supposed to sell short when prices break this uh, line, right? I think that's called the neckline. Is that what that's called? Okay. Right? Is that's called the neckline. You're supposed to sell short here. That's, that's the rule that's in all the trading books ever written. Someone tell me, though, what's the problem? What's the problem with this, uh, with this pattern? What's the overall problem with, what's the major flaw in conventional technical analysis? Why don't we see people making money with it consistently, you know, over and over and over? There's one glaring flaw to the entire school of thought when it comes to technical analysis. You're selling after a drop in price. Right? And you're selling at a price point where typically the market has had demand. It goes against how you make money buying and selling anything. It's the opposite of buying at wholesale, selling at retail. In, uh, someone mentioned a W pattern. Someone tell me this. In that W pattern, where are you supposed to buy? When's, when's the point where you're supposed to buy when you see that chart pattern? Right, yeah, exactly, Frank. Yeah, um, where, yeah that, that W pattern, what, what's the problem? When are you supposed to buy? You're supposed to buy, right? Let's see if someone, someone gets it. Who knows these W patterns? Um, Right, I'm trying to look for one here. I don't see a, a good one here, but um, well, I guess maybe you have one here. Is this one like is this is this kind of one developing here? There's your kind of W pattern, right? I mean, so when are you supposed to buy? What's what's the rule that's in all the trading books ever written on W patterns? Yeah, you're supposed to buy, exactly, Ed. You're supposed to buy above the pivot high once price breaks the high. 
moral of the story is, and I know we've been talking about this for a few minutes, but look, if, if someone's new to trading and you, and you don't have this information that we're talking about right now, you could literally spend years trying to do something because you read it in a book and do nothing but lose money. The inherent flaw in all these chart patterns is you're buying after a rally in price and you're selling after a decline in price. All of the, almost all those chart patterns, I can't think of one right now where you don't do that, but they're, they're all the same thing. Does everybody understand that? What percentage of active traders would you say lose money? What percentage of people lose money would you say? I know none of us know the exact number. I don't think anybody does. But generally, what, what percentage of active traders lose money? Yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty high, right? Most people, most numbers you see are, are higher than 75%. Uh, but, but yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a big number. Um, Frank's saying 90%. Yeah, it might be there. It might be higher. It might be a little lower. But the majority, okay? So now let's put these two things together. Most people that start trading, they, they're reading books, they're looking online, and what's, what's the majority of information you're going to find? Technical analysis. Think about it. Most people out there are conditioned and taught to buy after a rally in price and sell after a drop in price. And we see that most people lose money trading. Is, is there any surprise in that? Last question, then I'll leave this alone and we'll go on to charts. How many times have you heard a new trader say, say something like this? Boy, if I just took the other side of all my trades, I'd have so much money. Meaning like they get into the market and immediately price goes in the other direction. You ever heard people say that? And a lot of times it's kind of the newer, the people that are kind of newer to this. Yeah, right? It's, it's very common to hear people say that. Do you understand why? Right? Um, if you're buying after a big rally in price and into supply, price is likely going to fall pretty quick. If you're selling, right? If you're selling after a drop in price, which all these chart patterns have you doing, right? And into demand, price is typically going to rally pretty quick. So again, there's all these kind of puzzle pieces we could put together that really explain all this information, but I think you get the point. And I just, you know, normally I wouldn't rant about it that long. But look, if, if it just saved you a, a ton of time and money, then it was worth it. All right, let's go on and look at another market. Uh, okay, let's go here. I'm just scrolling back to see what people want to look at. Looks like a couple requests for the Swiss. Let's go right to the Swiss. No problem. And remember, when we bring up the dollar Swiss in the back of your mind, should be, okay, where's that U.S. dollar again? Coming down to that man zone, possibly. All right, in the Swiss, let's start with the Swiss futures, because I have uh, updated levels in this market, I believe. Yes. Yeah, this is one we were looking at before. Um, so I actually had an order to buy into this market. Um, the problem was, I believe, don't quote me on this, but I'm pretty sure my order was down here. I didn't take the upper part of this, I took the lower part of this. So obviously I didn't get filled. But you can see how powerful the gap demand zone was here. Um, do they all work this well? No, but the gap, this is a good, a good lesson on, you know, gaps represent the biggest supply demand imbalance typically because, again, supply and demand is so out of balance, you don't even get any trading there, right? So um, anyway, price turn there, it's now headed higher. Let's go, um, let's go down, a, or, or let's go to, well, you can see the, the zone on the daily chart, but let's go down a time frame, and we want to look and see what is above current price. So this area up here looks interesting. We're looking for a supply zone, or perhaps a demand zone below to join this move up. So we come down time frames to take different kind of x-ray snapshots of this market, so we can find um, our quality supplier demand zones. All right, so now we're down to a 60-minute chart, and now we're starting to see some, some evidence, some, some, uh, some levels. So we want to start with current price, look left, and go higher until we find some supply. And we have kind of have two levels on top of each other here, so let's put that in. 
We'll go with that level right there. And we'll go with that level right there. So both these supply zones are fresh, meaning the last time price, uh, when price left these levels, creating these supply zones. Um, they have not been back to this area once. That's what we mean by fresh. All right. Um, okay. So let's see here. Okay. I was just reading back in the chat a little bit. Yeah, Carlos, you know, that's a, that's a good question. Um, you know, it all depends on, you know, what you're, what you're, are you learning the right thing? Are you not? Are you practicing the right thing? Are you not? You know, do you have the discipline uh, needed to wait for prices to come to your quality areas and your opportunities? Um, do you have the discipline to stick to your plan? All that stuff. Do you have the right plan? Um, okay. All right. So, first of all, we're looking for, and we can go over this, this bottom one here. So, we're looking for the pattern that represents supply in a quality zone. Right, so I can go over a few things. We don't have time to go over everything, and there's not a lot, but you know, very little trading in here. So price is trading sideways here, and all of a sudden it drops. That we, you know, we don't try to anticipate this decline in price here. We let it happen. Okay, once it does, that tells us, aha, we've now identified a price level where supply exceeds demand, right up here. Now. Understand that when price is trading here, um, you know, because how can we say that? How can we say, you know, supply exceeds demand there? Well, if supply and demand were equal or in balance in this area, wouldn't prices just keep trading sideways? They would, but they couldn't, right? In fact, price couldn't stay here very long at all. And then it dropped and dropped in somewhat strong fashion. Those two things together are two clues that suggest supply exceeds demand here. Um, okay. You know, one of the other things you want to ask yourself is, let's say price comes back up to this area. When it does, if you're new to this, one of the things that's important to ask yourself is, now you may be ready to take a short position there and, and, and uh, you know, play the Swiss short from this level. But when you're new to this, it's important to really understand the logic and really, you know, own this information. And you might want to ask yourself when you're selling short here, who are you selling to? What do you know about the buyer? Now, you're not going to know their name or their address or anything like that, but what do you know about them? Well, when you look at their actions and behaviors, are they making a, you know, a, a, a logically solid, dis sound decision or, or not? Are they, are they making a decision based on logic or intellect? Are they making a decision based on what's real or based on what they feel? Very important to, to think like that. Well, number one, whoever would be buying here, and let's stick to the things that, you know, we, we know that, you know, more of the objective information. If someone's buying here, we know that they're buying after a big rally in price. That's typically not a good thing to do when you're buying and selling anything, right? Okay. So, you would, in other words, you would never, you would never walk into the uh, the grocery store and say, you know, to buy ice cream, and you go pick out your favorite, I don't know, vanilla ice cream. You bring it up to the counter, and uh, at the checkout thing, they say, okay, that'll be four dollars for your ice cream. None of us ever reply to that and say, look, I know it's only four dollars, but you don't understand. I like this ice cream so much, I want to pay you ten for it. Does anybody ever do that? No. But why is it that that's exactly what people do in the financial markets? There's a reason, okay? The news is good. They want to join the uptrend. You know, maybe there's one of those W's or cup and handles or any of those other, you know, goofy chart patterns. You follow me? Okay. And then the second thing that they're doing, not, not only would they be buying after a rally in price, but they'd be buying right into a price level where the chart already suggested supply exceeds demand. So, you know, it's a little bit of information that helps you really understand what you're doing. 
and understand the most important thing. Are you making decisions like a, like a novice retail trader or investor, or are you making decisions, you know, or like a, a banker professional? Okay. You know, I know the title of the webinar is, you know, uh, you know, help, you know, start to learn to, to think and, and trade like a bank, right? Well, when I started on the, uh, on the trading floor, you know, one thing I was excited about, I said, ooh, I'm going to learn the big, the big Wall Street secret, the secret of the professionals, right? How do, they, how do they make so much money? How are they right all the time? And I'm like, wow, this is going to be great. Well, the secret is no big secret at all. What the professional market speculator understands, what Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, J.P. Morgan, Barclays, they all understand that other people don't is the simple concept of how you make money buying and selling anything in life is exactly how you make money buying and selling in the financial markets, right? Most people have that backwards. Um, having said all that, I'm going to do this. There's my email address. And if you give me just a second here, I will also, um, I don't know if we did this, showed you this last time, but let me bring this up for you. And um, I did a session this morning, and I want to share um, something out of that session with you. So let me just bring that over here. Yeah. And um, there it is. So we can probably oop, blow that up. Anyway, so, you know, um, based on what's going on with the coronavirus and everything else, I, I, I put this up for, uh, for our members in one of our sessions this morning. And, um, you know, it, it's all about the thought of the day here. When making a decision, don't let your emotions overpower your logic, uh, your logic and intelligence. Okay? Um, this, this, is, this is so true in the financial markets. And the main point is here, just be careful. Understand what you're doing. Don't put your hard-earned money at risk in the market unless you completely understand what you're doing. You understand the risk. You've proven to yourself that, um, you know, you know what you're doing on a simulator or even before the simulator. Be careful just opening an account and just start, you know, trading, trading, trading. Um, yeah. And that is what we're looking for, Carlos. And that's what these supply demand levels typically represent, the footprints of the smart money and the professionals. Uh, there's my social media um, uh, stuff on the bottom right. If you want to connect on social media, you can always do that. And um, having said all that, it was, uh, I know we're out of time here, but it was great to be with you. You have my email address in the chat, and there's a social media if you ever want to connect and have any questions, comments, whatever, we can always. Uh, uh, just let me know. Yeah, great to see everyone, and we'll see you next time. All right, have a great day.